Ahem. Hello once again. First we got familiar with vectors, then we looked at the vector nature of velocity, and now it's time to talk about acceleration as a vector. So for some reason I just can't get away from these, uh, these falling kitties. So you, you release a cat from rest at time zero, and when you first release that thing, it's not moving yet. One second later, it's now moving at a speed of approximately 10 meters per second. So notice I have not put the arrow under the V, excuse me, over the V. So instead of referring to the velocity at time one second, I'm really talking about the speed at time one second. If I wanted to talk about uh, the vector velocity, I suppose I'd have to have a minus sign. If I was going to call up positive, then I would need a minus sign. But I'm just talking about the speed. That's what V means. And I've drawn an arrow with a particular length to indicate that speed. Now, we know that the actual speed neglecting air resistance would be more like 9.8 meters per second, but I'm being approximate here. One second later, our, our cat is moving even faster. Now it's sped up to approximately 20 meters per second. That's why the arrow here is longer. Oh, I forgot about the trampoline. Let's put that thing in there for safety. And one second later, now we're going 30 meters per second. So what is the acceleration? Well, we've already observed or talked about how the rate of increase of the speed is the acceleration. You're speeding up by 10 meters per second. Every second, that's the acceleration. But how can we really regard that as a vector? If it is a vector, which direction does it point? Does it, does it always point in that direction? Well, recall in one-dimensional kinematics, we defined acceleration as the instantaneous rate of change of velocity. So it's, it's change in velocity over change in time in the limit as your uh, delta t goes to zero. It's the limit of the average velocity as delta t goes to zero. <clears throat> and there are no vector quantities here per se. This is just a, a, a number over a number. Can we turn this into a vector definition? How do we generalize that? Well, taking a cue from what we did with velocity in one of the previous presentations, let's just define vector acceleration as the time derivative of vector velocity. And look what's, uh, what kind of quantity we have in the numerator and the denominator. In the numerator of this ratio, because that's, that's what a derivative is for our purposes, it's a ratio, it's a change in velocity over a change in time. Well, change in velocity is final minus initial over some small time interval. If you subtract two vectors, you just get another vector. So delta V here is uh, a final minus an initial vector over a very small time interval. That's just another vector. So we're taking a vector, delta V, and dividing it by a scalar. And recall from the previous discussion, dividing by delta T, that's the same thing as one over, or multiplying by one over delta T. We know that means to scale the vector up or down. So there's really nothing mysterious about this at all. We're right back to talking about the difference quotient. We've got a function of time. In this case, that function is velocity. We're looking at the change in that function uh, over a time interval, and then we're dividing by that time interval. So our independent variable, instead of x and talking about f of x, we're, we're um, examining the ind independent variable t and talking about a function v of t. But this is still the difference quotient, and we're we're analyzing the limit of that difference quotient as delta t goes to zero. That's what we're calling vector acceleration. Okay, let's take a look using this graphic here at the acceleration between times one second and two seconds. Now that we know that we're going to define acceleration as the change in velocity over change in time. So all I've done is translate my two vectors over here Remember, vectors are movable or roundable. Uh, I still have the, the vectors with the same length and direction. That I have not changed. And I'm calling them, well, since there's no arrow here, I guess I'm really referring to the speed at time one. That would be the length of this vector and the speed at time two. Now I've turned them into the actual vector symbols because change in velocity, which we're going to need to examine the acceleration, Change in velocity would be the final velocity minus the initial 
Well, right now my initial and final times are T1. I shouldn't say. Okay, so there's kind of a subtle point here. V2 really means the velocity at time two, and V1 is the velocity at time one. Those are just labels. Time one, time two, those could be any times. You know, time one could be 50 seconds. Time two could be five years later. It just so happens that in this example, my time one is one second, and my time two is two seconds. That's not a necessary uh, restriction on the notation there, okay? I want to emphasize that. Well, we've already looked at the fact that subtracting a vector is equivalent to adding the negative of that vector. So by, by rewriting delta v as an addition, that will allow me to make a picture of it with vector addition. We know how to turn vector addition equations into a picture. When you're adding vectors, you have to place them tip to tail. So negative v1, take this vector and flip it around, switch its direction to turn it into negative v1, and then put that vector tip to tail with v2. If you look down here, here's the tip of v2, and it's next to the tail of negative v1. I have placed them tip to tail. Now, ironically, this is uh, more difficult to visualize than an actual triangle. This is what I call the degenerate triangle. In a previous video, it's like you've collapsed a triangle down. You've squashed it down to just a, a line segment. But if you compare that to an actual triangle, uh, remember the sum of two vectors, in this case u and v, the sum goes from the tail of the first vector to the tip of the second vector. And that is what I've done here. Um, since I'm adding v2 plus negative v1, I go from the tail of v2 to the tip of negative v1. That's actually the sum of the two vectors. If you don't see that, you should think about it for a moment. You want to be able to visualize that. This red vector is the sum of v2 and negative v1. You could just think about it kind of like displacements, right? This is not a displacement vector. Uh, velocity is related to displacement, but if, you were, if you're a little ant and you walk like this and then you walk back, isn't that the same as just walking from here to here? Maybe that's the easiest way to think about it. But the objective here was to, to be able to see the direction of the change in velocity, and now we've got that. Here's another way to, to think about it. If you go back to this equation here, let's take uh, V1 and put it on the other side. Basically add V1 to both sides. If you have a negative V1 and, a, and then you're adding V1, those would cancel, leaving you just with V2. And on the left side, you would have delta V plus V1. So do that and you wind up with this equation. And this might be easier for you to interpret. It says that if you start with your initial velocity and then just add the change you wind up with the final velocity. And it makes sense. If, if you're already going this fast in this direction and you get a little extra boost of velocity in the same direction, now you're going in that same direction, but you're going even faster. So if you write it this way, it allows you to um, stack these up in a sense, put them, put them tip to tail. See, the first tip to tail business that I did was I put V2 tip to tail with negative V1 to get delta V. Over here, I'm putting V1 tip to tail with the change in velocity to get V2. Maybe this is easier for you to visualize. In any case, why are we doing this? Well, remember, acceleration is basically change in velocity over change in time. I say basically because we have to be precise with our language here. If you take a finite change in velocity over a finite time interval, then you're actually talking about uh, average velocity. This only becomes instantaneous velocity in the limit as delta t goes to zero. Now, right now we're talking about time intervals of one second. That's obviously a finite time interval. So this would be the average velocity. This vector here um, points in the, in the direction of the average velocity during the one second time interval between one second and two seconds. Now I say points in the same direction because uh, finding delta V isn't enough, right? If you want the acceleration vector, the last thing you'd have to do is divide by delta T. Now, again, it's, it's just happenstance that in this example, my time interval is one second. So when you divide by one, that's the same as multiplying by one. We don't actually have to stretch out our vector or shrink it. It doesn't change the length. So 
Um, finding the direction of the change in velocity is basically the same as finding the direction or finding the acceleration vector. The larger the change in velocity, the longer that acceleration will, will be. And as the direction of delta V changes, that indicates that the direction of the acceleration has changed. So now what I've done is to move this uh, delta V slash acceleration vector over here to the picture. And by placing it in between those two velocity vectors, it helps you, uh, help, it helps you see that that's the acceleration during that time interval. It's not surprising that it points down, right? We know that the, the cat is picking up speed because of gravity. We think of gravity as pointing down, so that's not surprising. What about if we now repeat that procedure for the time interval from two seconds and three seconds? Let's see what sort of acceleration vector we get that accounts for the change in velocity during that next time interval. So you can see here, I've redrawn vectors V2 and V3. We can see that V3 is longer than V2. That indicates that the cat is speeding up. And again, the change in velocity between times two seconds and three seconds is final minus initial. Well, V3 minus V2 can be written V3 plus negative V2. So let's put, since, since this is addition now, let's put V3 and negative V2 tip to tail, as I've done here. The tip of V3 is in contact with the tail of negative V2. If V2 points down, negative V2 would have to point up, so I just flip that vector, and then I've got my degenerate triangle. I close the triangle, and the delta V looks just like it did before. Of course, that's by design. I drew this picture to be consistent with what we know about um, free fall acceleration. So the delta V comes out the same. Remember, if you mul or divide by one second, that's the same as multiplying by one second. That doesn't actually change the length of your vector. Now, what if uh, I had picked, what if I was looking at the velocity over quarter second intervals, like every 0.25 seconds? Then to turn your delta V into an acceleration vector, you would actually need to divide by 0.25, which is the same as multiplying by four. So you'd have to stretch all of your delta V vectors out by a, a factor of four. The problem with that is your vectors might become so long that they start to overlap in your picture and it's not easy to interpret. So really, th there's no need to scale them. As long as your time intervals are equal, you would be stretching every one of your average acceleration vectors by the same amount and that's insignificant to the interpretation. So you might as well just forget about the stretching part. Don't worry about scaling by delta T and treat your delta V as your acceleration vector. That's good enough for the purpose of just visualizing acceleration, just getting a sense of which direction it points. Okay, so take this vector, put it over here, and evidently the, the acceleration is constant on the way down. We've already been talking about this for a few weeks now, that uh, it's an experimental fact that as you drop something in the absence of air drag, the acceleration is constant. We're very close to constant. Remember, as you approach the surface of the Earth, it does get slightly stronger, but it's almost impossible to tell the difference if you're talking about distances like even the top of a skyscraper. Just in case you're having trouble visualizing this acceleration, I pulled up a demo video for you. I'm not going to drop it, you fool. I'm going to drink it. And once I turn back into my beautiful self, I'm going to kill you. <laughs> Okay, moving on. So by the 16th century, somewhere in there, uh, the work of Copernicus, Galileo, and others had the scientific community seriously considering the possibility that the planet moving in uh, circular orbits. I say circular because, no, Kepler was before Galileo. So yeah, but they already knew about elliptical orbits, which we'll talk about towards the end of the semester. But Serious consider consideration was being given to the possibility that the sun is at the center of the solar system, 
and everything's making these giant circuits around the sun. And that led some people to, uh, to ponder what Okay, maybe you've spent some time thinking about if these planets are just going around and around, where are they getting all that energy from? Where does the fuel come from? Because if you get in a car and drive around a racetrack forever, uh, well, you can't. At some point, you're going to run out of fuel and your car will come to a stop because it takes energy to do that. So, uh, you know, where's the energy coming from with the planets? Because as far as we, we know, they've been doing that for billions of years. Earth's been doing it for something like four and a half billion years. I think that's true for all the planets because uh, in my understanding, they they formed at around the same time. Is, is the energy coming from the sun? Like, is the sun somehow uh, pushing them along? Is there some invisible hand, some cosmic hand that reaches in and provides a so-called motive force? I think that was the phrase used by some of the thinkers at the time. So this is, this stumped some of the uh, some of the scientific thinkers in the 16th century, people who took up these issues in their their musings. Where does the energy come from? What what is the nature of the force that propels these planets along in their circular paths? I try to think of any any example of, of circular motion that doesn't eventually die out, like because there's a loss of input energy. Here's a totally not to scale picture of planet Earth going around the sun. There's a number of things silly about this picture. For one, there's no giant circle that you'd see from outer space. And the Earth looks way too big compared to the sun. I think the sun is something like 110 times the diameter of the Earth. And also the Earth would be much farther away, way off the screen. So is there some invisible cosmic hand pushing the planet forward. You, uh, we've already established the fact that um, any particle in motion always has an instantaneous velocity which is tangent to the trajectory. So here I've drawn that tangential velocity and presumably if you wanted to keep the Earth moving in that direction you, you'd have to be pushing on it. Just think of if, if you're dragging uh, a piece of furniture across the floor you have to keep pulling or pushing in the direction that it's moving. Um, if you've got a dog on a leash and it won't budge, you'd, you'd give it a little tug in the direction that you want it to move. I don't know, I don't have a dog, so is that considered inhumane? Um, what other examples? Uh, a car, or uh, how about a horse-drawn carriage? Uh, the horse has to pull on the, the carriage in the direction that it wants the carriage to move. So as the Earth moves around its nearly circular orbit around the sun, would that that invisible motive force always be pushing in the direction that the planet moves. This guy has a really nice visual to help you understand that question and, and perhaps even answer it for yourself. Sonny is zero. So what's going on when it's in the hoop? Well, the hoop exerts a contact force on the ball at right angles to its surface. And that force changes the velocity of the ball. The force is always directed towards the center of the hoop, the center of the circle. Take away that force and the ball obeys Newton's first law and carries on moving in a straight line. Hmm, that's interesting. This is something we'll talk much more about as we get into chapters five and six. Uh, it's really the content of Newton's first law. Now you'll notice when he took the hoop away, the, uh, the ball continued to roll off on a tangent line. Remember, we know that the instantaneous velocity is always tangent to the trajectory. The trajectory here is circular. So when the ball was right about here, he removed the hoop and the ball continued along that tangential velocity. It did roll to a stop, but that's because it struck this um, deck of cards. And it, all, it also stopped because of friction. But imagine if you were in outer space away from any gravitational influence, of course that's impossible, but pretend there's no gravity, there's certainly no atmosphere. If you were to throw a tennis ball, what would you expect it to do? There's no reason that it would curve if there's no gravity, it should just go in a straight line. And why would it ever slow down if there's no air drag, no friction? I think we all have some intuition about that. Um, I've come to the conclusion, that, excuse me, the conclusion that the reason anybody living in modern times isn't too surprised to hear about Newton's first law 
Newton's first law is the one that says what I'm, what I'm talking about just now. If you go into outer space and throw a tennis ball, it's going to keep going in a straight line, constant speed, forever, unless some force acts on it. That's not really surprising to most of us. And I think it's because we've all grown up um, seeing things like uh, bowling balls roll down uh, a very smooth what do you call that? The not, not the bowling alley. The uh, I'm drawing a blank here. We've seen bowling balls roll unobstructed. They only stop because they hit something at the end. Um, specifically, air hockey tables. Anybody who's ever seen an air hockey table has a really good sense that that puck, once it's on that cushion of air, it's going to just keep going in a straight line. There's no reason it would uh, change course unless it struck one of the walls of the the air hockey table. So when you've seen that with your own eyes, especially as a young kid, you have intuition about what we call inertia, uh, Newton's first law, the content of Newton's first law. Things just keep going in a straight line at constant speed. But hundreds of years ago, when people were using horses to get around, um, any vehicle that did have wheels didn't have the kind of um, low friction bearings that we have today. So things very quickly rolled to a stop. And you didn't see baseballs being hit at over 100 miles an hour. You just, you never rode in an airplane, certainly, or a, a car even. And even the horse-drawn chariots, I'm sure, had much lower speeds than today's cars, and they tended to stop very quickly. So the idea that things just want to keep going forever in a straight line without loss of speed, that was a foreign notion back then. To us, it's kind of obvious. So my point was, yeah, the point was, if we go back to the, um, hang on a second here. When you bear that in mind and then revisit this, this problem, when you bear in mind the tendency of things to just continue moving in a straight line at constant speed, you start to get a sense that perhaps it's not necessary to continue pushing on a planet in the direction that it's moving. That you know, if, you, if you weren't pushing on it and you could somehow get rid of the gravitational influence of the sun, this planet would just fly off on that tangent line so if that's the natural tendency, then why is, it, um, why is it deflecting from that straight line path? Well, maybe you have some sense that in order to get it to, to bend or deviate in its trajectory, you would have to push not in the direction it's already moving, because it doesn't need to be pushed in that direction. It'll, it will keep going in that direction by itself. You would actually have to point at right angles to the direction that it's already moving. Perhaps like this. And I threw up a... Isaac Newton's mug. By the way, I don't think this was a wig. He really had that awesome hair from what I read once upon a time. Um, perhaps, yeah, I was going to say I, I put up his image because I believe that he was the first person to really understand the dynamics of circular motion. Galileo may, may have had some sense of what was going on, but prior to Newton, nobody could really put it together. But he certainly understood that there must be something pushing towards the center of the circle in order to get the planet to deflect from what it would otherwise do. What would it otherwise do? Just continue in a straight line. You can also think of your own body in the passenger seat of a vehicle. Let's say you're in the car, you're going around a circular track, and when the car turns left, the tendency of your body is to just continue going in a straight line. So if, if you weren't sitting on the seat, if there were no friction between the, the upholstery and your butt, and you weren't wearing a seat belt, your body would just, would just continue to go forward. But obviously that doesn't happen. You stay inside the car, so you continue to move along that circular path. Something must push you towards the center in order to get you to accelerate, really, to get you to deflect. And the, the force that causes you to deflect comes from a number of things. There's, again, there's the contact force between the seat and your butt. You're not normally aware of that. You may also feel your shoulder even pressed against the, the passenger side door, and the seatbelt's going to help a little bit as well. So there's a number of forces between the vehicle and your body that, ex that uh, cause you, your body to deflect in its trajectory. Having a little too much fun. Hey, what happened to my mustache? That's in the wrong place. Okay, and now we need to review some basic math that many of you probably forgot or never learned, but this is essential to what we're doing here. So let's go over it carefully. I've drawn a circle, well, somebody else drew a circle. Here's an arbitrary angle, theta. And 
these two radii, they both have radius, or they're both length r, that's the radius of the circle. Those two radii uh, intercept a piece of arc along the circle. We will use the letter s for arc length. So s is the length of that piece of arc in inches, meters, whatever. And while you're most accustomed to measuring angles in degrees, very often in uh, applied math, it's more natural to measure uh, angles, not in degrees, but radians. So what is one radian? What is the definition of one radian? Obviously, this is more than one degree, right? In fact, if you like to memorize things, one radian is about 57 degrees. Well, a radian is the angle that's just big enough to intercept an arc length that's exactly equal to the radius in length. That's it. So, it, it's very simple. If you were walking around a circle, let's say you start here, and suppose that the, the, uh, the circle that you're walking in has a radius of 20 feet. Okay, you're walking around a big circular track with a radius of 20 feet. If you walk 20 feet around the circle, you have just turned through an angle of one radian, which is about 57 degrees. That's it. Walk one radius around the circumference and you have swept out an angle of one radian. And there's some really nice visuals on the web, so let's take a look at a couple of those. Here's the first one. There it is. So you take that one radius, wrap it around the edge of the circle there, and that angle will be one radian. Continue that line of thought there. You see what's happening there? They're reminding you that um, the, the number of times, let's go with the example I used previously. I said um, a circle of radius 20 feet and if you walk 20 feet around the circle, that's an angle that you've turned through of one radian. Well, how many times can you do that around a semicircle? You can walk one radius, two radii, three radii. After that, there's just a little bit left. So you can walk something like 3.14 radii around a semicircle. And that is why we say that the angle you've turned through is roughly 3.14 radians, or to be precise, pi radians. Do some Googling. You can find these all over the place. And I've got one more here for you. I found this on the Giphy website, G-I-P-H-Y. They've got a lot of great math GIFs if you just use the search bar. Moving on, okay. These are the letters that we will be using often. R for the radius of a circle, choose an angle theta, and the arc length intercepted by that angle we will call S, S for arc length. And this is the formula that defines an angle in radians, not degrees. This equation does not work if you would like to measure angles in degrees. It only works for radians. So in order to determine an angle theta, you merely take the length of the arc that it intercepts and divide by the radius. Take the ratio. In other words, you ask, how long is the intercepted arc compared to the radius? For example, this is a very rough estimate. I, I would say that this arc length is, actually it's probably more like one half of the radius, but let's just say it's a third. Let's say that three of these equal one of these. So suppose that the arc length is one-third of the radius. When you go to calculate this ratio, what's one-third of a radius compared to a radius? Of course, it's one-third. I mean, we're going around in circles here. If you say that the arc length is one-third of the radius, then of course the ratio of arc length to radius is one-third. Well, if that's the case, then your angle would be one-third 
of a radian. It's the most natural definition you can imagine. If, um, if you walk two radii around a circle, you have walked through two radians. And at this point, maybe you're, you're so sick of me repeating myself, you're gonna throw your phone or smash the computer screen. Good, that means I've repeated myself enough. Well, if you solve this for arc length, just move R to the other side, you should memorize both of these formulas because we will use them often. Take the radius, multiply by an angle, and that gives you a distance in meters. And th this is a theme that will uh, occur repeatedly because we're also going to look at the expression for uh, speed around a circle based on your angular speed and even acceleration around a circle based on your so-called angular acceleration. And in each case, you take your angular quantity, you multiply by uh, the radius, and that gives you a different quantity with different units. In fact, you're just picking up uh, the units of meters every time you multiply by r. So please memorize this. What if we'd like to write the, the so-called differential version of that equation? If we're talking about an infinitesimal angle that we've turned through, then we would have traced out an infinitesimally small arc length. So S becomes DS, theta becomes D theta. This is also a very useful way to think about the result. But don't forget, there's no mystery here. This just comes from the definition of an angle in radians. That's what this equation is. Flip that inside out, solve for D theta. And for the purposes of this slideshow, this is probably the most important way to think about it. A tiny little angle d theta can be calculated by taking the arc length that it intercepts and dividing by the radius, okay? ds over r is the angle in radians. And this guy's got a, ni a nice demo that I think we'll explore a little bit. So he's got um, a sparkler on the end of a string, and he, he fixed the string to a power drill. And as this thing's whipping around in a circle, the sparks are flying off. This is the same video I pulled up earlier. You can pull that up on YouTube. And you'll notice that uh, one of the sparks, I think it was going around in this, yeah, it would have to have been going around in this direction. So one of the sparks was released when the end of the string was right here. And you can see that that spark has launched off tangentially. And you, I can't even see any curvature here, which is interesting because when you throw a baseball, don't you immediately see that parabolic trajectory? Why does this line actually look straight. It's just because this, the little spark that was flown off is moving really quickly. So you can't really see the curvature, but there is curvature there. Nothing, <coughs> excuse me, nothing in free fall can actually move in a straight line. If you're in a gravitational field, there has to be some curvature. That's actually true for light as well, which is something that Newton pondered. When we talk about gravity, we're going to talk about the gravitational attraction between massive objects, material objects that, that are made out of atoms. Um, so it wasn't clear to Einstein whether or not light should also bend in a gravitational field. He had a hypothesis about it, but it wasn't until Einstein came along with his theory of gravity in, what, 1910, 1912, that the answer to that question was found. Okay, well, uh, you can see multiple lines here when various sparks were thrown off. It looks like uh, this spark would have been released from the end of the string a little, you know, just a moment before this spark was released and went off in its tangential direction. But at the very least, this graphic shows us that um, all, of the, all of those sparks, which were on the, you know, they were going around in a circle, they were obviously moving tangentially at the moment they were released, and then they continued to go in that direction. So let's um, guess at the circle described by the end of the, the string or the sparkler. And I will overlay some velocity vectors. So the first sparkle left right about here, it would have had a velocity in this direction. I'm sorry, that's actually the second sparkle. The other sparkle I'm thinking of would have been released just a moment before from someplace like this, going off in a slightly different direction. And now we're done with the, the background here. So uh, I'll have to put this into a black circle so we can use a white background. Those are my two velocity vectors. Now this is kind of a subtle point. These two vectors represent the velocity of two different sparkles that were released from the sparkler. But uh, since the sparkles were released by the sparkler, 
their velocities show you what the velocity of the sparkler was. So you can really just think about these two vectors as showing you the velocity of the end of that string that had the sparkler on it. Uh, it it's showing you that velocity at two different times very close together. That's what we're looking at here. Let's draw radii from the center of the circle to the point at which those, those two sparkles were flown off, kicked off from the sparkler. And it's not a very small angle, but let's pretend that it's an infinitesimal angle because the argument that we're going to make here becomes more accurate the smaller your, your little wedge angle is. And I will label the velocities V1 and V2. V1 because it, uh, this was released at time one, the next sparkle was released at time two. And if this angle really is infinitesimal, if, if the string on the, the drill bit only turned through an infinitesimal angle, then that had to have happened in an infinitesimal time interval. So the later time is just a tad bit later than the initial time. That's important here. You're gonna see reasoning like this throughout the semester. If it's a d theta, then we have to be talking about a dt. Everything's gotta match up. By the same logic, the, uh, the end of the string or the sparkler would have moved through an infinitesimal distance. We're not talking an inch, we're talking just a fraction, a very, very tiny fraction of a millimeter or really the limit as you go to zero. So all three of these quantities are infinitesimal. And now we use the, uh, the trigonometry that we just reviewed. This angle d theta should be equal to the arc length traversed by the sparkler divided by the radius of the circle. Arc length over radius. And here's a fact from geometry. If you draw a radius to a circle, uh, the tangent to the circle at that point of intersection is perpendicular to the radius. Once again, the, the tangent line to a circle is perpendicular to the radius that intercepts the circle at that same point. So these are both right angles. So now I'd like you to think about what angle this vector V1 has to turn through to get it to line up with V2. Just imagine a V1 is a vector that's attached rigidly to this radius. You know, maybe there are two pieces of wood glued together. If you then turn this radius through an angle d theta, do you see that this vector would also have to turn through an angle d theta? In other words, if I take these two vectors and I scoot them over, and I place them down here, uh, joined at the tail, the angle between them must also be d theta. And that's because of the, uh, the perpendicularity here. What else do we know? Well, remember from our previous discussion, final velocity is initial velocity plus delta v. That's really just the definition of delta, right? It's final minus initial. But in this instance, I'm choosing to write it as dv, not delta v, because again, it's an infinitesimal change in velocity because we're examining two times that are infinitesimally close together. And now we've got another wedge, just like this wedge. Maybe you're getting hung up on the fact that this is a straight line. I didn't actually draw a piece of arc. But can you accept that um, in the limit as d theta goes to zero, the straight line segment between these two points of intersection uh, becomes equal in length to the arc length? You know, for big angles, they'd be totally different. But as you let this, this angle d theta go to zero, the little arc length and the straight line segment, they have the same length. I believe that's called the skinny triangle approximation. Okay, and that means that we can just pretend that this is uh, like a sector of a circle. We also know, I should have pointed this out, but we're operating under the assumption that this particle that's going around and around, or in the case of the uh, sparkler, it's the end of the string connected to the drill bit. Let's imagine that it's moving at constant speed. So even though it's changing direction, it's not speeding up or slowing down. And if that's the case, V1 the speed, so notice there's no arrow here. I just mean the speed at time one and the speed at time two, those would be the same speeds. So let's just call them V. The letter V represents the constant speed as you move around the circle. And that's why I've replaced, um, see in the previous slide, I, I was saying V1 as a vector. Now I'm, I'm merely referring to the length of this vector, which is V on both sides.
here's the kicker. Here's where we're going to pull everything together. Go back to our little formula for the definition of an angle in radians. This angle d theta should also be expressible as the ratio of this arc length divided by this radius. And maybe you're thinking, radius? That's not a radius. It's a velocity vector. True, but watch what happens to the velocity vector as this um, sparkler makes a complete circuit. Doesn't the velocity vector also precess around a whole circle? So you can imagine a circle of velocity vectors, and during a time dt, your velocity vector sweeps out an angle d theta. So we can really use this equally as well as the actual physical circle. And so I've taken the, I've taken the magnitude, or the length of dv, and divided it by, in air quotes, my, the radius here, which is the speed v. This should also equal d theta. And maybe now you see where we're headed with this. We've got two different expressions for d theta. If they're both equal to d theta, then we should be able to equate them. So that's our next step. Let's set these two expressions equal to each other and do a little bit of math magic here. What I've done in this step is to multiply on both sides by v. If you multiply on the right by v, you cancel the v's, and over here you pick up a, a factor of v. What's next? This is a, a common trick in some of these little calculus derivations. Let's just divide both sides by dt. So we're not really taking the derivative here. This is something a little different than what you might do in a math class. We're recognizing that derivatives represent ratios, infinitesimal ratios. So we're choosing to divide both sides by dt, just like you would in algebra. And then um, it doesn't really matter whether you look at the equality here. What if you had uh, the vector dv divided by dt? If you want to get the absolute value of dv over dt, what you can do is just calculate the average value, excuse me, the absolute value of dv, and then divide that by the number t. That might require a little bit of thought here, because that's kind of subtle what I did here. I, I pulled the 1 over dt inside the absolute value sign. But that does work, if you think about it. And now, what is this quantity here? You should have alarm bells going off in your head. dv dt, we recognize that quantity. Whoa, that is acceleration, right? And that's what we've been looking for. We are trying to describe... Um, the acceleration of something moving in a circle. And you know what? I need to go back because I forgot to make one important point. When it comes to an object that's in free fall straight down and is speeding up or slowing down, it's fairly obvious why the acceleration is 10 or 9.8 meters per second per second. It's easy to understand because we know that the object is speeding up or slowing down by 10 meters per second every second. But now we're talking about um, so-called uniform circular motion. If you're going around and, uh, around and around a circle at constant speed, like the sparkler, for instance, if, if the end of the sparkler is always moving at the same speed, what does it even mean to say it's accelerating? If, it, if it's not speeding up and slowing down, why is it accelerating? That's a common, I won't call it a misconception, because somebody who has not studied physics may not be aware of the, the physics definition of acceleration. But we've already shown that acceleration is the rate of change. It's the time derivative of velocity. That's velocity vector. Vectors have a direction. So if your vector velocity is changing direction, then the vector is changing. And that means there ought to be an acceleration. So you have to broaden your notion of what it means to accelerate. Acceleration is any change in your velocity vector. So you could either be changing the length of that vector, which means speeding up or slowing down, or you could be changing merely the direction. And that means you're turning. Anytime you're turning, you are accelerating. And, and what we're about to do is, is find a formula that gives us a number for that acceleration. Like how can you, let's say something is moving in a circle, like the sparkler. It's possible for this sparkler to be accelerating at 10 meters per second per second, even if it's not speeding up and it's not slowing down. What does that even mean? How can it be ex accelerating at 10 meters per second squared if it's not speeding up or slowing down? Well, it's because there's a, a vector 
associated with that acceleration, and that 10 would have to be the length of that vector. So that's a very important point. When you assign a number to your acceleration, you are talking about the length of the vector acceleration. If you have some means of finding that vector and measuring its length, then you know what that number is. Let's continue here. We made the, the first important realization that this quantity on the right side is the absolute value or the length of the acceleration vector. That's that number I was just talking about. Evidently, the left side here will allow us to calculate what that number is. So what's this next quantity here? ds over dt. ds over dt. Well, remember, ds is arc length. It's the distance the particle has traveled around the circle during that small amount of time, dt. ds over dt. Think about the units. You could measure arc length in meters. You could measure time in seconds, meters per second. That's a very, a very familiar quantity. Meters per second is like inches per second, miles per hour. It sounds like we're talking about a speed. In fact, it's a speed that's already written on this slide. It's this letter V. V is the same as ds dt. If you trace out two meters every one second, then your speed is two meters per second. Now, of course, I said one second just now, but dt is supposed to be infinitesimal. So you trace out some tiny amount of distance in a tiny amount of time. Both of those numbers are basically zero, but when you take their ratio, you get a particular finite number, and that number is the speed, v. So let's now replace ds dt by v, and voila, we get this result. See, you would have a V times a V over R. In other words, V squared over R. And this, ladies and gentlemen, is one of the formulas that you really want to tattoo on the back of your eyelids. Unless you're good at memorizing things, then you can just memorize it. You should have it on your note card, but more importantly, I would just memorize it. Because if you don't have it memorized, it means you don't understand the material. You haven't done enough practice problems. This is going to be like 2 plus 2 equals 4 for you. Anytime you're moving in a circle at at constant speed, if you're moving in, in a circle at constant speed, which is what we call uniform circular motion, then you are accelerating, despite the fact that you're not speeding up or slowing down. You're still accelerating, and that acceleration vector has a length that can be calculated from this formula. And we call it centripetal. We call it the centripetal acceleration. You've heard a similar word, centrifugal. There is a connection there. We probably won't talk about that. Um, I'll say a little bit more about that when we get into the chapters on Newton's laws, but we will be talking a lot about centripetal acceleration, and this word literally means center seeking, seeking the center. So why, why would they name it that? Well, we've already taken a look at the direction of dv. All you have to do is, uh, you know, do the vector subtraction, put your two velocities tail to tail, and we know that the definition of acceleration is change in velocity over change in time. Remember what it means to take a vector, dv, and scale it by a, a factor of one over dt. When you divide by a scalar or multiply by a scalar, you don't change the direction of a vector, you merely change its length. So by finding the direction of dv, we really have found the direction of the acceleration vector. Evidently, um, it would have to point in the same direction. And I've made it red because your book tends to use red vectors for accelerations. Okay, now as far as the length of this vector, well that's going to depend on what the actual ratio is between the magnitude of dv and the magnitude of dt. <clears throat> so the faster you're going and the tighter the circle that you're turning through, I'm getting that from right here, the, the bigger the numerator and the smaller the denominator, the greater the magnitude of that acceleration. That's what will determine the actual uh, magnitude of this ratio here. But at the very least we can see, sure enough, it does point towards the center. If you're looking really carefully, you can see that probably this is off center just a little bit, and that is only because my angle here was finite. <clears throat> I had to construct the picture with a finite angle or everything would be overlapping and you wouldn't see anything. But in the limit, as d theta goes to zero, if you were to repeat this procedure with the vectors, you would find that dv really does point towards the center. So that's, that's a separate statement from saying that it points down. You can see right here, 
acceleration kind of points down on the screen. That's not always going to be true. As soon as the particle is over here, if you were to draw a velocity vector tangent there and a velocity vector tangent there and repeat the procedure of finding their difference, you would then find that the acceleration vector points this way. So it's not that it points down, it's that it points towards the center. For an object in circular motion, the velocity vector is always changing direction, but it's, uh, it maintains its tangency to the circle. The acceleration is always changing direction, but it maintains, uh, well, it's always pointed towards the center. And that direction is going to change because the location of the particle changes. Keep in mind that those statements are, uh, are only applicable for a uniform circular motion. Later, we will see that if you're moving in a circle and speeding up, like if you had a tennis ball on a string and you were whipping it around and you were whipping it faster and faster, then the acceleration vector would not actually point towards the center. So we'll look at that exception later. So I guess our, our um, correction a few slides back was accurate. I suggested that I, if some invisible hand is not necessary for for pushing a planet in the direction it's already moving because it'll do that on its own, then perhaps the necessary force would have to be perpendicular to the direction the planet's moving, in other words, towards the center. And we've established just now using the definition, the vector definition of acceleration and a little bit of geometry, we've established that yes, indeed, a planet moving in a circular orbit does have an acceleration that points towards the center. And that would imply a force towards the center. This is the main result of the entire semester. You may not believe me, but the entire curriculum can be developed with this one result and calculus, really. That's all you need. It would take some ingenuity to do it, but that's the entire curriculum is, is built up from Newton's second law and calculus and Newton's third law, but that's, uh, that's easier to wrap your head around. Okay. So memorize that. If it helps, we'll blow it up here. Maybe this helps even more. Memorize all of these formulas, please, okay? Memorize this entire slide if you would. Now, I don't know how old Newton was when he worked out that result. I am fairly confident he was the first person to develop that formula, but uh, he did apply that immediately to the motion of the moon, the, the nearly circular motion of the moon around the Earth. It wasn't the first time that he had considered that problem. I think in his early to mid-20s, maybe you know the story, that he was supposed to be uh, at university, but there was a horrible plague uh, ravaging England, kind of like now, but probably with more death and devastation. And as a result, he was stuck on his family's farm, and he ended up getting way more done than he would have gotten done at school because he was um, you know, an independent thinker and he had all this free time to follow his own curiosities and work things out on his own. And he did consider the acceleration of the moon, but I believe this was before he had developed calculus or, uh, and it was before he had that formula worked out. So he had to use a different type of geometric reasoning to find the acceleration of the moon. And because they didn't have Google back then, or the internet, of course, he had to look up some numbers in an almanac, and he failed to interpret a nautical mile as a nautical mile. He thought it was a regular mile. And so his, uh, his calculations came out a little bit wrong. And as a result, he, he abandoned his early hypothesis about how gravity works. It turns out he was, he was on the right track. He just made that one little goof. So I think it set him back by 10 years. He did many other things in the meantime, but it's just interesting that a trivial mistake like that could, could alter the, the course of his progress. Okay, so can we apply V squared over R to something like the moon moving around the Earth in a circle? Yeah, I had to fix the font here because people didn't think in sans serif in the 1600s. It had to be this fancy font. Here is a representation of the Earth, excuse me, the, the distance between the Earth and the Moon that is actually to scale. Hard to believe that there's this much empty space between Earth and the Moon. I believe the Earth is something like four times the diameter of the Moon, roughly. In fact, this is a, a figure that was known in Newton's time. Astronomers 
had measured the distance to the moon fairly accurately. Um, in fact, that was done well before Newton. We're talking like 2,000 years ago, people made an estimate of this measurement. And that might be worth memorizing, that the distance to the moon is about 60 times the Earth's radius, which would put it at 30 times the Earth's diameter. That tells you that you could stack up the Earth 30 times before you're out at the position of the moon. And that looks about right in this picture, because if I stack it up 10 times, I think it's going to be around here, 10, 20, 30. You don't need to know this. I just pulled this up uh, as an example of how somebody in ancient Greek times, believe it or not, knew the distance to the moon roughly. I think multiple people made that, that measurement. This video was released by NASA. The date on the YouTube channel is 2013, which is a while ago now. This was the Juno spacecraft, which has been sending back some uh, really impressive close-up photographs of Jupiter and Jupiter's atmosphere. If you haven't seen any of those photos, you should really take a look. It's, it's kind of unreal, the detail that they've got now, the detailed views of the atmosphere of Jupiter. But it takes a long time to get to Jupiter. That's why this spacecraft evidently was launched you know, on or before 2013, because that's when this video is from. And on its way out to Jupiter, it turned its camera back and, and took a little selfie, so to speak, of our planet and moon. Does anybody have a tissue? It's so beautiful. Let's apply our formula now to the approximately circular orbit of the moon around the Earth. You may be aware that it's more like an ellipse, but that doesn't concern us. So here's the moon moving tangentially at all times to the circle with the radius that we established was about 60 times the Earth's radius. And in order to use the formula V squared over R, you should have that memorized, we need to know what the speed is. You could just look that number up in a table, but let's express it as the distance moved by the moon in one orbit, otherwise known as the circumference of the circle, divided by how long it takes to do that. Total distance over total time. In other words, the speed should be 2 pi R divided by the period. So, very often we will use this letter capital T for the period of anything really that, that happens cyclically, yeah. especially orbits. We're talking often about things revolving or rotating with a, a particular period, capital T. And if we plug those numbers into our formula, we will know the acceleration of the moon. That's kind of interesting, right? Now, why is the moon orbiting the Earth to begin with? What's causing it to do that? Well, we all know, we, I think most of us know it's, it's got to be gravity, something to do with Earth's gravitational field. And now is a good time to, to point out that when Newton first wrote his law of gravity, which we will talk about soon, uh, I don't know if it was him that, that put the word universal in front or we did that later, but it's often referred to as his universal law of gravitation because he may have been the first person to fully appreciate that the same physics which causes the planets to revolve around the, um, the sun or that causes the moon to orbit the earth, that same physics should, should be what causes an apple to fall from a tree to the ground. So you, you've all seen that iconic cartoon picture of an apple plonking onto Newton's head, and that supposed to, you know, supposedly gave him some great insight. I think what that story is supposed to capture, that apocryphal story,
it's supposed to capture that he appreciated that um, this, that same phenomenon which causes an apple to fall towards the surface of the earth should be the one that explains why the earth goes around uh, the sun. Because in his time, philosophically, I think a lot of scientists may have believed that there was a certain set of laws that described what happens here on earth and totally different rules for what happens in the heavens or the so-called celestial sphere. Newton may, may have been the first to seriously suggest that there should be a single law for both. So let's talk about, very briefly, the sidereal period of the moon. The synodic period is the word for the amount of time from one full moon to the next. It's the amount of time it takes the phases of the moon to repeat. And that ends up being a slightly different amount of time than the amount of time it takes the moon to orbit the Earth. So the orbital period is what we call the sidereal period. And the reason for the difference has to do with the fact that Earth and the Moon are simultaneously orbiting the Sun. The Sun's rays are, of course, related to the phases. So I'm just helping you visualize the sidereal period. That's how long it takes the Moon to orbit the Earth once through 360 degrees. You can Google the Moon's sidereal period. I found that it was 27.3 days. Let's convert that into SI units. 24 hours in a day, every hour has 60 minutes, every minute has 60 seconds, so we multiply by 3,600, and that's more than I expected, over 2 million seconds in a month. All right, so every time you get paid on, it's the first of the month, you've got another 2 million seconds you have to wait for your next paycheck. Or unemployment check, right, at this point in time, in this, this crazy time in our country's history. Okay, distance to the moon. 60 times the Earth's radius. Well, this is a number you'll see often throughout the semester. The radius of the Earth in kilometers is about 6,400. And if I convert that into meters, that would require multiplying by 1,000. Three times 10 to the eighth meters. So the Moon's way out there. What is that in miles? I don't know, but a big number. Plug all that into the formula for the speed. This is the cir circumference, 2 pi times the radius divided by the time. And the moon is hauling around the Earth. When you look at the moon, it doesn't look like it's moving, does it? I mean, if you pay real careful attention, like you probably noticed, um, if you look at the moon when it's just above the horizon, when it's just starting to rise in the east, you can look back 10 minutes later and it's like, whoa, it, it just went way higher in the sky. So it's more noticeable when it's near the horizon. But once it's high in the sky, you can barely even perceive its motion, and yet, Remember, one meter per second is over two miles per hour. So this thing is moving at over 2,000 miles per hour. 2,000. Even a jet goes, what, 500 miles an hour? So let's just say roughly five times as fast as a passenger jet. That's how fast the moon is moving. Did I do that right? Yeah. And yet the motion is barely perceptible from here on Earth, and that's because so far away, right? It doesn't matter how fast you're moving. If you're far enough away, you can't even detect. Think about all the stars you see in the sky. They look stationary, but most of them are moving much faster even than this. Now that we know the speed and the radius, or, uh, that's the radius of the moon's orbit, plug those numbers in, and moment of truth, what exactly is the moon's acceleration? If it's moving in a circular orbit, it's not really speeding up or slowing down, and yet it's still accelerating because it's turning. That acceleration is a vector. What is the length of that vector? Let's plug the numbers in and find out. It's a small number, 0 0.0027. So how come it's not 9.8? Yeah, this is what I was trying to uh, get my way to a few minutes ago. I was talking about um, how the moon is orbiting the Earth because of gravity, and we know that here on the surface, the acceleration due to gravity is 9.8. So I was going to ask, do we expect the moon's acceleration to be 9.8? Well, it's clearly not. It's got a much lower acceleration than 9.8, despite the fact that it's accelerating because of gravity. So why isn't it 9.8? You may recognize immediately, perhaps it's because the moon is so far away. Maybe if the moon was orbiting closer, 
its acceleration would be closer to 9.8, or you're thinking, well, it's not falling towards the Earth. 9.8 is for things that are falling straight down. They, they speed up by 9.8 meters per second every second. The moon is not doing that. It's, it's orbiting the Earth. So maybe there's, there's no reason to expect that the acceleration would be 9.8. But check this out. If you take the number 9.8 and you divide by 3,600, which just happens to be 60 squared, you do get the number we calculated from V squared over R. Hmm. 9.8 divided by 60 squared. Probably just a coincidence, right? It's just some weird numerological result. Just some weird, you know, those things happen in life. It's like winning the lotto. No significance to that whatsoever. Or is there? Is it a coincidence? Or was Isaac Newton onto something? Hmm. I don't know. Or do I know? Where's that 60 from? Yeah, I remember that 60. That 60 showed up in the distance. So let me get this straight. If you go 60 times as far from the, the center of the Earth, because remember, what's our distance? When we drop a rock and measure the 9.8 meters per second squared, our distance from the center of the Earth is basically the Earth's radius. But if you go 60 times as far out to where the moon is, evidently the moon's acceleration is 9.8 divided by 60 squared. And that is a result that's already been touched on. That's what we call the inverse square law. So we will talk much more about that later in the semester, but Newton was the one who uh, was able to confirm that, that the force law for gravity is an inverse square law, that as you go twice as far from the center of the Earth, you're now down at one quarter the acceleration. So I'll save that discussion for later. But it's nice to tie everything together. I don't think, they, they probably don't work at the, the Target store that got um, totally ransacked recently. I forget what city it was. I'm guessing they work at a different one. Okay, last point here. <clears throat> We've talked about two special types of acceleration thus far. We looked at uh, a cat falling straight down, in which case it was easy to see why the acceleration was 9.8, because that's the rate at which the length of the vector increases. The, the, excuse me, the length of the velocity vector, right? The velocity vector is getting longer by 9.8 meters per second every second. That's a very special type of, of acceleration. Um, and then we, we looked at centripetal acceleration where the acceleration was perpendicular. Yeah, in fact, I think I'd like to contrast that with the slide, so hang on. So for uniform circular motion, motion at constant speed in a circle, the velocity is perpendicular to the acceleration. And for free fall motion straight down, that's the, the case of the kitty falling towards the trampoline, we found that the acceleration is actually parallel to the velocity. So you're, you're accelerating in the same direction that you're moving. When I say the direction that you're moving, I'm talking about your velocity. Those are, the, those are two um, very different examples. Acceleration and velocity are parallel in this case. For the case of uniform circular motion, acceleration and velocity are perpendicular. Now, does it always have to be one or the other? Must the two vectors be parallel or perpendicular, or can it be something in between? Well, here's a nice graphic from your book. Imagine a ball or something just very slippery sliding down an embankment, uh, and then it kind of bottoms out and goes back up a ramp on the other side. Think about how the velocity is changing. So you see that the velocity vector is getting longer at first, that's an example of acceleration. That means you're speeding up. And if you're speeding up while moving in a straight line, that would mean that the acceleration points in the same direction that you're moving. So A and V here are parallel. So you should try to memorize that right now. If A and V are parallel, then the particle is speeding up but not turning. However, towards the bottom, um, the ramp that we're moving on picks up some curvature. So the particle has to turn and if this actually was a ball rolling down a hill, you would expect it to be turning and continuing to speed up. It's still speeding up because it hasn't reached the lowest point yet. 
So because it's speeding up, let's look right here. Because it's speeding up, there's still a component of acceleration in this direction, but there also has to be a perpendicular acceleration to affect the turn. You've got to have a parallel and a perpendicular component if you are simultaneously speeding up and turning. <clears throat> what about at the bottom point here? Um, this is where you reach your maximum speed, so you're neither speeding up nor slowing down. You know, a moment later you will be slowing down, but at this point you've, you've reached an extremum. That's where the, you know, in 1D calculus, that's where you say the slope is zero. So the rate of change of speed is zero here, but you are still turning. See the curvature here? And for that reason, there's only a perpendicular component of acceleration. That's what accomplishes the deflection. That's what causes you to turn. But uh, there's, no, there's no parallel component of acceleration because we're neither speeding up nor slowing down. Once you get up here, well, now you're slowing down because you're on your way up the hill. You're still turning slightly. So if you look, there's, there's a backwards component of acceleration but there's still a perpendicular component because you're still uh, turning a little bit here. By the time you get up here, there's no longer any turn. The acceleration is purely anti-parallel to cause you to slow down. So there's a ton of information in this one graphic here. This graphic makes it easier to see how one can resolve the acceleration into components. The projection onto the velocity vector tells you um, whether you're speeding up or slowing down. In this case, the parallel component points forward. It's in the direction that velocity points, so we would be speeding up. If this component pointed backwards, that would tell us that we were slowing down. And then the other component, the orthogonal or perpendicular component, tells us that we're also turning. Okay, so you can always resolve an acceleration vector into a parallel component, that means parallel to the velocity, and a perpendicular component. For circular motion, this is the component that we call centripetal acceleration. So definitely memorize that. Once you have resolved the acceleration vector into components parallel to and perpendicular to velocity, the perpendicular one is what you would call the centripetal acceleration if you're looking at motion in a circle. Here's that same graphic but um, shown on the larger trajectory graph. Actually this one's slightly different because here you can see that the when, when you look at the component of the acceleration vector along the velocity, you find that it actually points backwards. That tells you that you would be slowing down. Now here's, here's another important point. We've talked a little bit about coordinate systems and your choice of x, y axes. Usually the most convenient choice is an x axis that's horizontal and a y axis that's vertical and you would resolve your vectors into components along those axes. And that's what they've done here. You can take this A vector and project it horizontally and vertically. That's a different way of resolving the vector into components than this method. So physically, this one's easier to interpret because we know this component changes the speed. This component is what causes the particle to turn. But as far as using trigonometry to um, find components or um, actually solve a problem, sometimes this is easier. Just be aware two different ways of resol resolving the same vector into components. And I know you're really disappointed that I have no more gifts for you. That is the end of the gifts and the end of this presentation.